bet I have been part of St. Mary's before all of you were born. <laughs> that's, that's probably right. And that's not much of an honor. <laughs> but when you think about it, Father George joined my hand to Andrea's hand in 1977. You better get that right. <laughs> <laughs> so in 1977, I was footloose and fancy free. I was a resident in Grand Rapids. I was going to all the conventions. And then I saw my wife, Andrea. And I said, she's the one. And Father George was there as a young priest in 1977. So I was always active with our faith, orthodoxy, and Father George and I had bumped into each other, and I was living in Grand Rapids, originally from Indiana, but we knew each other or knew of each other, so I said, Father George, can you introduce me? So it was late in the Friday afternoon, and Father George said, sure, sure, and he, he introduced me to Andrea. And we started talking, but then she was from a first-generation family, and her dad said, well, you know, she needs to come home tonight. She was there for the Olympics that were a Friday afternoon when I met her, but the hafla was Friday night. So I convinced Father George to call her father. <laughs> her father then agreed that she could run home an hour drive from Toledo. We met in a Toledo Archdiocese meeting. She went home, changed, came back with her sisters, because you never could date just one of the family. You had to date <laughs> like all the cousins and everybody else. But anyway, we've been together since then. So when Father George always says how old he is and he's done all these things for the church, I'm almost the same age as him. <laughs> he's like three and a half years older than me. So I don't like it when he tries to slow down. I always correct him on that. So I've been part of St. Mary's my whole life, I feel. I was born and raised in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I love my home. And my family has a, a proclivity of starting churches. My uncle started two different Methodist churches in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And my mom and dad started the church in Fort Wayne, St. John Chrysostom. And my mother was the longest living choir director for 55 years she taught choir with no training. She never, was, she never had any training in it. She just loved the church. So I came to Christianity and Orthodoxy pretty easily. We were taught to be obedient, so I followed what they said. And it's worked out for a long, long time. Subdeacon Mike was saying about trying to figure out a man's role in Orthodoxy and maybe starting some type of discussions or men's clubs surrounding around that. And I thought, golly, he and I came to the same conclusion recently because of this guy, I don't know if you've ever heard of Tony Evans. He wrote a book called Kingdom Man. Who is this Tony Evans? Tony Evans is a Christian in Texas who basically has he started from the ground level up with his relatives one of the largest churches in texas one of those evangelical churches that has ten thousand people at their church service he came from a broken home where his mom and dad basically fought they were going to separate but the dad fell into christianity they were an impoverished family living like less than paycheck to paycheck and the mother refused Christianity. But the dad, what they would do is they would go to sleep. They had four kids, and every night he would go up, go to bed with his wife, and wake up at midnight to read the Bible. And after a few years of that, the wife came down. She would always yell and scream at him, and the kids always heard this turmoil. One night she came down crying and said, she's going to accept Christ. So here, this meager family come together, and this Tony Evans was one of the children, and from there, he decided he wanted to be a preacher. He played sports and all that kind of stuff. Well, the kind of guy this kingdom man is, he is the religious director of the Denver Mavericks and the Cowboys. 
So he goes every Sunday or Saturday or before games and preaches to the players. And he's developed a mega church. He's raised a wonderful family. Many of them play professional sports. His, one of his son plays professional football. So <clears throat> I, I'm going to give this, first of all, to Father Jim to see if he approves of it, who will then give it to Michael. And if they like it, there's actually a Bible study surrounding this book. He's written Kingdom Man, Kingdom Woman, but it's very interesting. And it may be something that we can use because it shows the Christian place of a man. It's not an ego place of a man. It's a shoulder responsibility of a man of what we need to be doing to lead our family and lead our therefore city block and therefore our community and therefore our city and the state and the country in the right direction. But it has to start at home. So, and it's going to start with us here, all of us guys here, that we can kind of create this wonderful generation energy and come together. Um, you may think that I read a lot. I'm really busy as a physician, but I drive and I'm in the car probably an hour and a half a day, so I listen to these books on tape. This is also a book I have to get approved by Father Jim, but it's very interesting because all of us are from the Middle East, right? So we, how many of us live and breathe and talk and have businesses or take care of patients that are Muslim? So I, all of our children, one of the things that we face is that all of our kids are growing up knowing a lot of Jewish people, a lot of Muslim people, and they're wonderful people. We love them. And our kids come to believe, so I'm an old man, but I still have a 21-year-old. So I, Andrea and I have had this big separation and of uh, children, so we go from 36 down to 21. And living in such a diverse community as we all do, one of the hardest parts that you're going to find is that our, our children who are trying to raise Orthodox, trying to raise Christian, you find out that they all believe, all of our kids believe in one God. So the Jewish, the Christian, the Muslim, we all believe in the same God. So to try to understand that and better be a better educator father to my kids, I, I, I you know, I, I've read hundred books, but this one kind of really hit at home and it says it's seeking Allah, finding Jesus. And what's interesting is that this, exactly like the kingdom man, is a hundred percent about mentoring. It's all mentoring in life. So, and you can take it home and just read it there. I mean, what are you doing this weekend? Just read it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I find that <clears throat> I'm lucky that I, I'm, I, I belong to Audible. And Audible had a special for $100, you get 12 books. And then if you don't like them, you can return them. And you can really get 18 books a year for that $100. And I listen to them all the time, whether you're at the gym, whether you're in the car. So I listen to a lot of books, but these two kind of caught my eye and I'm, I'd like to share them with you. Tonight, thanks to Hytham, he asked one of my best friends, Sammy and I, to give a discussion about mentoring. And I, I'm very dear to that. And actually those two books are gonna talk about mentoring. Um, the person that converted this gentleman to Christianity actually was a mentor and a debate team colleague. He and his Christian friend were on the debate team. So they debated their faith, even up to when they were supposed to be on stage debating, which they won a national award for, but they would always argue and debate against each other about Christianity and Islam. That's all they did. But they still were smart enough to win all these debate tournaments, so it's kind of a cool book. So I'm going to start off tonight, and I only have a couple of slides and you have to tolerate this because Hytham said I wasn't supposed to make slides, but I don't know how to talk without slides. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, it's just who I am. So you see Sammy and myself. So what's the definition of mentorship? 
It's a person who guides. That's all it is. <clears throat> when you decide to mentor someone, you try to create a partnership. Partnership relies on each other. They bounce ideas off each other. They work together. And the bottom line goal is to succeed as this partnership. And that is going to be success in finding your faith, having a better marriage, coming to Christ, learning how to be a car bus, anything, anything in life, you can try to find a mentor to help you succeed. So a mentorship is about finding something you want to succeed at and finding a partner who may have more experience than you to kind of gain that position. If you look at the earliest examples of mentorship, there's some of the mentorship we have no choice, right? It's mom and dad. My dad worked all the time, so my biggest mentor was my mother. And you always hear Father George talk about his mother, because our, our dads always work. But we're trying to change that here. All of us p parents, all of us dads, I think we should be involved with this. And if you can't be a good partner with your wife who has more time to be with the children, then that's fallen down. So you have to realize that both parents are important. You can't just say it's my wife's job, right? And so you have no choice on that either. So me as a little boy, I'm stuck. Likewise, how many of you have children now? How many are altar boys? Ah, you should have more altar boys. They're stuck. They're stuck with him. <laughs> Hide them. You can't avoid him. So, but it's very important. That's why we want to partner with Hytham, right? I like to help my mentor him. I like to be his friend. I want to be his partner. Because whether or not you realize it, he probably spends as much time with your children as you do. It's at least three hours in church. Whether he's having them line up, whether he's having them bow, kiss the hand of Father Jim, you know, it's, he's a very important person in our life. So we need to realize that some of the altar boys are afraid of him, but, but he does a phenomenal job. I wish he would teach some Arabic back there too. You should. You should teach the children some Arabic, and you should help many of those younger kids when it comes to say the, Father, or the Lord's Prayer in Arabic, you should be mentoring them to do that. He? Oh my God. <laughs> you mean it's been a fake all this time? I thought he spoke it well. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> and then other things you don't have a choice on, like you need a summer job when you're growing up and you decide to do landscaping. Like my son, Andrew, and Denny did, they worked in a, in a, a bump shop in a car place and they worked uh, cutting grass in the summers and doing things like that. But I chose who they went to, but a lot of kids don't have that choice, but you should look into that. So if you have a child that's going to take a job, one of my jobs was the choir director for a big mega church, an African American church downtown, but that's where Denny worked for two years. Well, that's pretty good mentorship. Another one of my kids, uh, Andrew, he worked with a landscaping company where the guy who was doing the landscaping actually was the mayor of Troy. So he had some good ethical, responsible things when he was teaching the whole time. So summer jobs are very important. It's just not a way to make money. So when you allow your kids to work outside of your house, that's mentorship. So you better make sure who they're with. And I can tell you, I chose my kids' jobs very carefully, but I never let them know I chose it, you know? I would talk to the person, I'd have them apply, but I made sure of where they were working, and all of you should try that. It's very, I know it's underhanded, I'm sorry. <laughs> I gotta apologize. Now, what, what types of things can you control? Because I gave you three examples, especially you know, can't choose your parents, you can't choose who's in the altar, but you can start to help mentor the kids where they work. And now we start to choose things. So when I came to Michigan, 
and I moved here in 1985. When I came to Michigan, it was kind of interesting. My parish in Fort Wayne were basically involved with the Troy Church, a wonderful church. And so more Lebanese people were over there, and I'm more Lebanese and Syrian than I am Palestinian or Jordanian. And then some of my family were involved with the Berkeley Church and some people only the Grand Rapids Church. But I chose my church because of Father George. I watched him. I watched what he was about. I watched him network. I watched how he helped people. I watched how he had an intra-faith and a intra-business kind of sense that I've never seen before. He's, I, I, I see a lot of Muslim people in my office and practice every day and they always ask, how is Father George? He's crossed the racial barriers, the religious barriers, the social economic barriers. How many priests do you know that are invited to the White House? <laughs> you know, Father George has been in the White House three or four times. Even Obama invited him to go to the White House, excuse me. So he's a very special person. I recognize that early on, and I'm so blessed that I was able to latch on to that. So I chose my church, and you can kind of see where we, where we are now. When you're in school, you can choose your friends. I wasn't that smart. I'm not a, I'm not a very bright guy. I work harder than everybody else, but I'm not really that smart. But all my friends were very smart. So when you talk about mentorship, you need to choose your friends wisely. Don't waste time. Pick people that have a direction. Pick people that are smarter than you. Hang around them. We're so lucky to have Father Jim. I mean, look at his breadth of what he's accomplished in his life. You know, from the financial world, from the business. I mean, you choose people to be associated with, and then you just sit back and learn from them and you become a partner and let them lead some of your life. Where you work in the summer positions, we already talked about that, sports, music, and gaming. Even gaming, which a lot of our teenagers are doing, and Jimmy was gaming with my son this weekend. We went and had a ski trip, which was very exciting. But they all are good kids. I did buy 12 beers and I, eight of them are gone now, but <laughs> other than that, other than that, it was a, they did nothing wrong because they were all good kids and I hope and pray they stay close to each other. So you make sure you choose with your children where they are and capture them and try to be with them because uh, you think they're your kids, but they're being mentored by the people around the world, around their schools, people they want to go hang out with. So you need to be very involved with that. I was a music nerd. I was a music major in college. So I had all these nerds I was with, and I also had sciences. So I just hung around all these really special people, and it helped me immensely. What is the quality of the mentor? The mentor has to be good and available. So the, the availability is very important. So you can't mentor and say, I'll meet you next Tuesday and I'm out of town for three months. So you want to be available. A mentor has to be an active listener. In other words, I, so I'm talking, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not being a good mentor right now because I'm doing all the talking. But a mentor has to be a good listener because you got to hear where the questions are coming from so you know what to address, right? So you have to be a good listener. And then, if you're listening, you need to be analytical about, okay, where has this person been? What kind of turns do I need to make to bring him into this fold to have a more straight kind of position of success? So mentoring is involving being available, knowing when to listen, and being analytical or judging kind of what you hear. The qualities of the mentee, the person that wants mentoring, he has to be available. He has to be, or she has to be a good listener. And one of the hardest things you're going to all find as you're trying to mentor people is how do you get them to really listen? You know, how big of a stick can you carry? Well, if you're mentoring someone who wants to get a job into a specific business, your stick is that the only way they're going to get this job 
is to follow these rules which you're helping them to follow. I happen to be on the admissions committee for a couple of medical schools. So I, I have so many students from college that want to spend time with me, but I don't want to talk to them. I don't want them to come into my clinic. I want to mentor them. So I want to hear where they've been, what they've been doing, and I want to suggest ways that they can grow into a better person, which makes you a better applicant, which increases your success to get into medical school. So the mentee, the hardest thing for them is a lot of times they're always kind of pushy and they're not open to suggestions. So you need to make sure that they realize the game plan, if you're going to mentor them, they have to be a listener and you'll start something and then you leave it digest and then you come back and see if they've done anything. Because sometimes the mentee just wants you to do all of it. And then I was mentored by a real estate guy. You've seen his signs. It's Steve Gordon with Signature, the Signature Real Estate. So I was listening to one of his lectures one time to all the junior uh, real estate kids. And he kept saying, SOI, 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 SOI. And I said, what the heck is SOI? And it's sphere of influence. What are examples of sphere of influence? It's where one person may introduce you to others with similar interests, work opportunities, or educational opportunities. Someone may have contacts that open doors to opportunities that you'd otherwise not be able to. So what Steve was trying to do is he called me and he brought me, <laughs> I was sitting in his office waiting for a meeting about something else. We built a medical building together. And he brought me in and says, here's an SOI. Well, I'm saying that to you guys so that you remember that each one of us has met somebody tonight that has a sphere of influence that you can network with that may be an opportunity. For instance, I met another real estate person here tonight. And if my Andrew wants to get into real estate, he may be a contact that I know he's a good Christian that I may call up someday and say, hey, would you mind if Andrew applied for a job with you? So it's one of those sphere of influence things. Or I have someone that's interested in marketing. And so I'm going to say, you know, I know this guy from church. He's kind of strict. His name is Hytham. And, but he does really good marketing. He markets for my wife. He markets for the church. He's a good guy. But I know he's a Christian. I know he's ethical. I know he's good at what he does. So that sphere of influence is important for all of us as we think about how are you going to mentor or be mentored or how are you going to raise your kids. I don't have very much more. So mentorship resources, family, 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 um, person of interest, church organizations, I'm sorry. Books, audible files, and podcasts. Now, one thing you need to remember is that I've shared with you two books that I have vetted, and I'm hoping Michael and Father Jim may vet and then you should read. But honest to God, I... Adam should read it too. Adam, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting. No, sorry, sorry. But I probably listened to 150 books, all Christian, um, all the ecclesiasticals from the popes. I've listened to probably 150 hours of that. I, Pope Benedict is really a wise kind of person, so I listened to a lot of his ecclesiastics. And then you kind of realize that some don't seem to be right, and Others seem to be orthodox and kind of the pain. But you may have to read two books that are opposed to each other. So you need to read a third and a fourth to then see that three kind of agree and one doesn't. So you have to be willing to dedicate yourself to doing those kinds of things. So when it comes to choosing your job, so what is work? So many times you think of it as a job. And I think sometimes you gotta get your head around to think of it as a profession or as an avocation. You're, when you go into work, unless you start your own job, like some of you have, you're kind of learning through being an apprentice, trying to gain more and more responsibility with every month, every year as it goes along. But what I have found most important in my career is that I have chosen a profession where I have lifelong learning. So I do that in my profession. But all of you can do that 
through our faith also, right? So I've, I've learned so much more about my faith as an adult than I ever learned when I was a child. And if you make part of your job serving others, then you become a SOI, person of interest, and then you'll never get tired. And that's kind of our faith too, right? You never, you never toil when you're helping someone else. That's what we do in our life as Christians. And then you look for growth opportunities and location, location, location. I, I'm fortunate I chose a job where I could work anywhere I want to work because there's job opportunities as a, in the medical profession. So if your kids want to go into nursing, your kids want to go into physical therapy, whatever it is in healthcare, there's a lot of opportunities for them right now. So those are just things that I think about as I'm just going along. And I think I'm done. Well, of course, Matthew. In everything, do unto others as you have them do to you. And you'll always feel good when you put your head on a pillow at night. And if you raise your children that way, I'm, I'm talking about kids a lot, I'm sorry. Many of you, I don't know if everybody has children, but you know, my whole life has been for the church and for the kids. And mentoring is just part of raising your family. And trying to do it well, you're gonna find ups and downs. But because my children, I, I look at your little beautiful son and all my kids were like that. My little Adriana is a girl. She would get as close as a girl could get to get behind the altar, or she was up in the choir. So, but they vary, they wander, and then they kind of come back over time. So uh, I think that's all I have to say tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. So Excellent. thank you, thank you, uh, Deacon. Uh, I appreciate all the, the backhanded uh, compliments. I feel personally attacked. Dr. Sen, before you begin, uh, does anybody have any questions for Deacon Dennis? So he, so he is a medical doctor, but he's also a deacon in our church, for those that don't know. So we always refer to him as Deacon Dennis or Dr. Dennis, whichever you prefer. But does anybody have any questions for him before he completes? I, I actually do, Deacon. Yes. Um, what do you think about like the reciprocation of that relationship? How like it almost feels like anytime you're you have a mentor, like you're also gravitated gravitating towards being someone else's mentor. Like anytime I feel like I'm working with my mentor, I find myself getting back into high school coaching. <laughs> yeah. It's just it's always like the two almost feel like they come hand in hand. Yeah. So I think you always give without expecting to return or get anything in return, mm -hmm. and. But the thought of giving makes it very satisfying. So I always, and I think that if you pick the right mentors, then your spirit, your heart, wants to then mentor other people. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, you're right. By having good mentorship, you will become a mentor. Just let your heart lead that. But when sometimes I'm a mentor, and I've led kids for four or five, six appointments, and I never hear from them again. You know what? That's just what you do, though. Yeah. It doesn't hurt me. I tried. I shared talents. Oh, my, my favorite phrase in the world is, when I stand before God at the end of my life, I would hope that I would have not a single bit of talent left that I could say. I used everything you gave me, God. I think that we all need to think about that. Where does that quote come from? I think it's a Matthew quote. It actually also comes from something I have hanging on all my walls at home. <laughs> and there's something like this at the Antiochian village, too. But it's like God's given us so many talents, and we don't even have the depth. My wife always complains, oh, can't you slow down? Why are you doing this? Why are you going tonight? You know, I start office at 6 o'clock. Today I had to get there at 5.30, and it's 9 o'clock before. And she says, why? And I said, because I want to share things. And the more you share, you're never going to be tired. You never get tired when you're sharing. And sometimes you don't get anything in return, but who cares? You don't need anything in return. The satisfaction of sharing your talent is all you need, I think. Okay, so um, first of all, I'd like to say thanks for having us tonight. And um, you know, Dr. Bojab and I have known each other for many, many years, and it'll become evident by my lecture. I'm going to try to keep mine a little more brief because that was our deal last night that um, <laughs> He was going to talk more, and I was going to talk less, only because he had less slides and I had more slides. Um, yeah, yeah. But I also have to say that I, I want to start like Dr. Bojab and say 
that I met my wife um, at Father George's 25th anniversary of being a, a priest. So I can tell you that the, the, the church has given, given me and uh, Dr. Bojrab so much. And you know, even so having something like this, a, a gathering of young men in the middle of the week, at night, and having you know, the guidance of uh, Father Jim uh, with us and Mike, and knowing that we have um, you know, this kind of leadership already, and all the talent that we have in this church, and we can share that talent with each other. And not only that, but young people. I mean, who's going to take care of us? We're old, right? The young people. If we, don't, if we don't bring them forward in a difficult world, then the world will continue to fall. But if we surround ourselves with good people, and we teach the younger people how to be like us, or to, you know, our traditions, and keep that strong, and um, I think that would be fabulous. So I think this is a great idea. Also, I want to I want to also say, you know, we've all learned from Father George. He's amazing, and you know, Father Jim is really, the, you know, he, that was his mentor, and not only that, but he connects with the young people and the older people. So he's like he's like the bridging father. So we love to have you, Father Jim, and we're always so happy to see you. I see him at graduations. I see him at church. I see him at skiing. I see him everywhere. So anyway, I want to begin. I, I don't want. I know it's getting late, guys. So we'll move along. My my lecture is a little bit more specific to the mentorship program. I think. Uh, Dr. Bojrav's lecture was definitely the best for the building blocks. And to give you a general idea, it's, it's kind of like looking outside the box. And it's hard to say what would better to, for him to go first or me to go first. But I really think that the building blocks, Dr. Bojrav's lecture was very strong. And so I'm not going to, um, I'm going to stick to my slides, some of the more detailed stuff. But I'm going to skip through stuff that he's already gone through, you know, definition of a mentor, someone who guides you. We're not going to go too much. But what are the benefits of having a mentor? Okay? A mentor it can benefit you in many ways, give you purpose and direction. Okay? They can be a person of like interest, somebody who has the same goals that you do. A person with like experiences, well, guess what? They did it first. You know, hey, maybe I can learn from that person. And a guide through times, whether they're good times or bad times. You know, yeah, you can share in the fun, but also, what if things get tough? Well, how did he do it or she do it? Okay? And then how to get through difficult, difficult to navigate things, you know? Sometimes it's red tape. Sometimes it's, you know, somebody's oppressing me. What do I do in this situation? How did you get through it? You know, I'm the chief resident stepping on me all the time. How do I, what do I do, okay? Um, many, many examples, many, many examples I can share with you, but honestly it would take the whole evening. But we'll, we'll, we'll kind of stick to the ones I think are gonna be the most important. And then you cannot choose a mentor and take advantage of him or her, you know? I understand it's a, it's a, it is a two-way street, but you're not, you're not using them to use them. You know, oh, can you call this person for me? Do you mind filling out this application? That's not what a mentor is, okay? A mentor is to get there to guide you, to help you make the right steps and make your life easier, not to do the work for you. So it, it's a respect, it's a mutual respect relationship. You have to keep that respect between you, okay? Um, benefits continued. Uh, what about that faith relationship? So people of the same faith, you know, how, how do we do it? But keeping Christianity into it. You know, yes, it's a business. Yes, we're going to make money. But how do we do it without stepping on our fellow man or taking advantage of somebody? But what about somebody of a different faith? Again, like Dr. Bojrev said, a, a Muslim or, 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 a, or a Jewish person. Wow, you know, wow, doctor, you seem to have a great relationship with your patients. How do you do it? I keep my faith involved. I pray with them. So there's so many ways that we can guide people and guide people in our profession but keeping our faith involved. And many of us, many of us, have used faith to get us where we are. I know, in fact, that I've prayed for getting into medical school. I prayed for my residency. I, I prayed for, I prayed before every day of surgery. I pray at night and thank God for what I did for the patients that I had. I pray for the patients that had a hard day that day. Say, God, let them make it through the night. Let them have a good day. Let them get better quickly. So we can show that to the people younger than us that we use faith every day in our lives to keep our careers going. I think that's a great way to show our, our, our uh, people. Um, how to form a mentorship relationship? Well, first of all, there has to be a reason to need a mentor. You have to have some purpose in life. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a doctor. I want to be an engineer. So, you know, or whatever it might be. I want to be a teacher. Whatever it is, find someone who is going to fit your goals and your needs. And I really think there should be a database. Uh, again, one of my favorite is seek and you shall find. Famous words of Jesus Christ. Seek and you shall find. So we seek the mentor, we shall find the mentor. And where better to look than in your own church? People who are smart and hardworking. Also, you got to understand that, the, that your mentor might have limited capacity. 
So you may have to res understand and respect their time. Again, they're professionals. They have a, a, a work life. They have a family life. They probably want to go to the gym or do some recreational things, but they also want to spend time with you. It just has to be, again, a respect relationship, like I said before. So don't expect that guy's going to be every time you pick up the phone, he better pick up, or what a horrible mentor. No, he's got to be there for you when he can be there or she can be there for you. Okay, And then you should have a clear goal. Write those goals down. I would like to know this. I would like to know that. And be ready to present it that way, almost in an outline form. I really think you'd be a great mentor for me, and this is why. So that you can form that relationship. Okay, um, And then here are the positives. Again, sharing experiences, life goals, uh, having the courage to seek those goals. If you're young and you go into a, uh, you go into a, a medical school interview, and this guy just hammers you and hammers you, you might walk out and go, oh my God, maybe I shouldn't be a doctor. What do you do? You call your mentor and say, this happened. Don't worry about it, man. You got another interview next week. Just you know, use it as education. You know, guide that person. Guide that person. Um, giving uh, life examples of someone else who succeeded. Once again, I did it, so can you. You're smart. Just put your, you know, put your nose to the grindstone. And then comfort, there's light at the end of the tunnel. You know, there are people in residency, and they, they're first year, now they're second year, they got three more years, and again, chief resident, or the attendings, they seem to don't like them, or they're making them do extra work or scut work, and he's thinking about quitting, or she's thinking about quitting. You're like, what are you thinking, man? You're gonna be a doctor, you're already a doctor. Now you're gonna be practicing. Just, just get your stuff together. So again, some people just need a little encouragement, a little push, a little shove, a little bit of guidance. So we can be that, we can be that person for them, okay? And then networking, once again, it's a, it's a two-way street. It's a two-way street. So not only are you going to help that person, but that person, is, as Dr. Bozhev said, that sphere of influence, he's going to get you involved or she in their sphere of influence. So you might be introduced to someone else. Okay, this guy's dad's internal medicine, but he wants to be an ENT or he wants to be a general surgeon, right? So guess what? That internist sees you helping his son. What do you think he's going to do? He's going to help you. You don't have to say anything. You just have to do what you do. So again, that sphere of influence will build, builds networking over time. Um, here's some negatives. Don't sing a mentor for the wrong reasons. Don't, you're not there to use somebody. You're not, you're, you're not looking there to find someone to make your life easy. You're looking for someone to help you, to guide you, to give you their experience. And don't treat them like they work for you. Okay? They don't work for you. They're there to help you and guide you. How about pairing with someone who truly has different interests? If you want to go into ER, why would you follow a paramedic? Okay? You don't want to do that. So you have to learn pretty early on that you're not following the right person. If you follow the wrong person, guess what it's going to do? It's going to take you outside your goals. You're going to end up going this way and not this way. So you have to find somebody with like interests who can guide you, who can say, you know, yeah, this guy really knows what I'm looking to do with my life. But if you pick the wrong person, then you're going to be turning your wheels, spinning your wheels, meetings, phone calls, and you're going to get nowhere. But you should find it out pretty quickly and find a different mentor, okay? Um, same thing with, uh, with a faith. What about mentorship and faith? So here we are. Most persons of faith feel they're fulfilling their destiny. I know that I feel like I was meant to be a physician from since I was a small child. So I can share that with you. Yes, God guided me. Then, and not only does that, it reaffirms your faith. It tells people around you that, wow, look at this guy. He trusted in God and God delivered. So we all need testimony in our lives, testimony to know that we have reaffirmation of faith. I mean, there's so many times in our life we hit a roadblock and we tell ourselves, does God really love me? Does God really want me to do this in my life? Well, again, we have a person with a faith relationship who can show you that if you trust in God, your, your dreams and uh, 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 aspirations will be fulfilled. So that's a good, good life um, example. And the other thing is service to the community and church. So as a mentor, okay, as a mentor, as Dennis said, Dr. Dr. Uh, and Deacon Dennis, that you are going to feel fulfilled in helping somebody. There's fulfillment in it. We feel good when we somebody see somebody succeed. I've trained, and I'm sure, do and I mean, I, I was a, a student under Dr. Bozhev. You know, when you see your, your protege succeed, it gives you so much more happiness and fulfillment and confidence. It's great to do one thing here, but it's another great thing to see somebody do the same thing that you can do, or even better. You should be happy for them. So that's what mentorship is all about. How many people here know a guy by the name of Dan Thomas? That's so sad to me. <laughs> because Danny Thomas was a household word in my family. He's from Toledo, Ohio. He was a stand-up comic. There was a Danny Thomas hour. He was Lebanese-American. 
He was the man that started St. Jude's Hospital, which has affected how many millions of lives all over the world. And he was a starving artist, didn't have a job, and he made a bargain with God, which we know we're not supposed to do. But his bargain with God was that if God would just let him have a brain, let him try to get into showbiz, he would create something good. And when he became successful, his first thing he did was start St. Jude's Hospital, which takes care of children from all over the world for free. And their families, right? For free. All started on bended knee. And his sphere of influence. Think about that. One guy, an immigrant American. My aunt is a babysitter in Toledo, Ohio. Yeah. Anyway, I was just sharing that. No, I, it's wonderful. So I would like to diverge and say, who's my mentor? My mentor is Dr. Bozrab. He's right in front of you, right here. So I'm going to just go through a small, uh, uh, my, my lifelong, I'll make it brief, but my lifelong journey with Dr. Bozier. I was my mentor, okay? And so when I was a resident, I, I rotated with him. I was a third year resident. That was over 25 years ago, 25 years ago. And I scrubbed cases with him. I learned how to do ear surgery from him. I learned how to even run a practice from him. I saw his amazing clinic with all these fellows and residents doing research around me. And I'm like, this place is incredible. Not only that, but he introduced me to my, to my partner of 18 years, same practice. He introduced me. I, I remember the day that he said, I have a friend who wants to talk to you on the phone. I went there and he said to me, he said, Sam, I want to meet you. Dr. <laughs> Bojrab says you're good. So Dr. Bojrab, he knew me firsthand. He knew how I handled myself in the OR. He knew how I handled myself as a person. He knew that I had, I had skills. I was only a third year. I could hardly operate. But he could see that I had talent. So he shared that with one of his friends, his sphere of influence. And he got me involved. 18 years, same practice. I'm still there today. And uh, there's more to talk about. I was on staff at William Beaumont Hospital for greater than 10 years. There was a manpower plan restrict restricting ENTs because there were too many ENTs. They didn't want competition. Okay. So what happened? He put his foot down and said, I don't care about your manpower plan. This guy's good. We need him on staff. He got me in right away. I was not restricted. Another thing, they were trying to keep me from doing facial plastic surgery. I did a fellowship in facial plastics. Why shouldn't I do it? Well, Beaumont had a way of keeping ENTs from doing plastics. They had a place called Suite 100, and they said, if you're not a general plastic surgeon, you can't use Suite 100. And guess what? You're not, you're not from an ACGME plastic surgery wrote, uh, residency. He went, he pulled the ENT boards, and he said, 25% of ENT boards are facial plastic surgery. This guy can do it here. And this is ACG made credited. So they let me do it. Then they restricted me from state 100. He said, that's unethical. How can you discriminate against physicians in this facility? They let me operate there. So once again, he stood up for me, put his neck on the line. And I, who was I to him? I was a little kid. I was a little kid. And he put his neck on the line for me. Okay? And he got everything uh, working for me. So what else? Excellent example of service. Not only is he my mentor in medicine, he's a mentor as a deacon. I go to church many times and I see him there and I'm like, how does he do it? How does he organize his time? So I'm still learning from him today. Also, he, he takes the time and he gives and, he, and, and, and shows how he helps. It. You think I'm his only student? No, he's got students all the time. So he's a mentor to so many people. We've had multiple ski tips together. We've prayed together. Father Jim's been part of those. We fed the hungry in Ohio, in Ohio together. So not only have we developed a business relationship, we've developed a faith relationship together. So that's what doing it at St. Mary's is all about, about having a mentor with your like interests, your like faith, and building together, okay, building it together. And then he's also there for advice with my children. How many times I pulled him in the, we've sat in his truck after church, and we've had discussions about our kids, and, you know, doctor, what, what, what should I do? I don't know what to do. And I have four girls. He has one girl. He still knows more than I do. So, you know, he's helping me with that. And then um, also financial situations. So many times I've asked him before I joined like a surgical center or bought into something, you know, what do I do? And he's always guided me right. Even if he wasn't part of it, he told me where I should go and what I should do. And I'll tell you 99.9% .9 of the time he was right. Why? Because, you know, he's done it before and he, he's been there. Okay. Also, he introduced me to my uh, new partner, Dr. Shenuda, who's over there. Yay. He was able to join us. And if it wasn't for that relationship, I, I don't know where I'd be today. I don't know where I'd be today without Dr. Bojrab and Dr. Shenuda. Okay? So 
They're, they're, let's bring it all together. Your mentor is there in your time of need. They, they, again, as I mentioned, introduced me to Dr. Shenouda. He put himself at risk many times in his career for me, even took the hit for me a few times, and I don't want to get into details about that. Uh, keeps a faith-based approach to everything that we do together. He, develop, he develops a plan, he's focused, and, and again, faith-based, and he even, even helped me with financial decision-making through my entire life, a uh, career, uh, of, career of, uh, of medicine. And then a uh, mentoring can be brief or can be lifelong. Once again, you might just need a phone call. You might just need a friend to say, yeah, you know, do this, do this research, or go over here or talk to these people. Or you might want someone who really wants to develop their life with you, like Dr. Bojab and I have. And then, like I said, I don't know where I'd be today without my mentor. I, I believe that God put uh, Dennis in front of me and put him in my life. And we say that, you know, God opens doors for you. And that was a big door that was open for me. And it's, and it's been the gift that's kept on giving, even up till today. So thank you, Dr. Bojrav, as my mentor. And then here are a couple of pictures of Dr. Bojrav as a deacon. That's, that was the Fellowship Matters um, drive in Ohio that we fed so many hungry people. I, I'll never forget that day. We had so many meals. and. It was a cold day, but it was so much fun. And then there's uh, Andrea and uh, my wife, Lena, that's Gus's sister, and um, his wife, Summer, and that was one of our ski trips together. And then here's everybody during this. It's a little dark, but there's the, one of the ski trips. So it shows you how we can build that mentor relationship together. Okay? Thank you all. Okay, awesome. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Samer, Thanks. for your presentation. It was very quick and very concise. Maybe you should mentor your mentor. Um, <laughs> 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 is that on tape? <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you both. So at this time, so uh, subject Mike is going to talk in a minute. Okay, we're, we're almost there. But while they're doing that, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Samer or Dr. Dennis? Okay, so Look for something up there. Here, that should be good right there. Well, you, uh, take it out. Uh, about vocation and how that fits in. Uh, it's connecting now, so give it a chance, and you should be able to go through Google if you want. Possibly a secular job, but also the hot using spot. the skills that you have oh, to support my church. Okay. Oh, I see on your phone or something. This, this, this is connected to the projector. Okay. Um, you trying to connect off your phone? Is that off your phone, or can you off it here? My dad really didn't graduate high school. My mom graduated high school. And their whole life was in the church, right? My dad's job in life was a water well driller. And my mom was a choir director, basically. As a water well driller, my father never tried to take advantage of someone. There, it doesn't seem like much of a job, but if you don't have water, you can't live, right? Especially in the country. So when he would drill wells, it wasn't unusual for, and we would always help my parents. Uh, he, we would go out on a Saturday or a Sunday after church, and we would go to a farm or some place to get water for the, 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 the person. And you know, I used to say, why, why are we doing this on a Sunday? He says, you know, if Mr. Smith doesn't have water, what's going to happen to his animals? You got, so you share your life, you share your faith. It's not just any job you have. It's not just a job. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a profession where my dad really enjoyed what he did. Never had any education. He worked with his two brothers, but he never took advantage of people. If someone needed him, he was always there. So, and then no matter what we did, we never did anything on Sunday morning if we could help it, right? So you always go to church, and then you live the rest of your, whatever other opportunities or, or work things you had to do, you did it afterwards. So how do you bring that back to church? It's amazing how many times you can use your Christian faith in dealing with people. For me, it's kind of easier than most patient, most people here in the room. But a lot of people are nervous when they have surgery. And we pray together before the operation on a lot of our patients. It's easy with the Jewish people and the Christian people. It's harder with the Muslim people. Then generally they don't want to pray with us before surgery. But we hold hands and we show them that we care and we will do whatever they ask. Um, so what was your exact question that you want me to answer? Uh, within the church, like how can you use your unique gifts and talents? Well, I mean, I feel that I read and I'm educated, 
So I tonight wanted to share something that I had learned with other people that may be interested in that. Um, I don't know a lot about giving sermons, but I've given a couple in my lifetime. And I go to church to show people what it's, I hope I'm mentoring my children and your children about being faithful and showing up and being part of the service and respecting and always listening to the sermon and not taking anything for granted. So I think that's lead by example, I guess. And then so many times, you don't know what it's like working for Father George. There are so, there, yeah. <laughs> I mean, for me, I'm a physician. And how many people does Father George know who want to get into medical school, have a problem? Just recently, his, his niece had broken a shoulder. Dennis, here, just, just take care of this. Can you find out a way? She has no insurance, no money, but <laughs> get it done. So, you know, I, I listen and I try to, you know, we got her surgery done. And that's been going on for years and years and years. But you never, and, and, but I never do it with not being happy. I mean, I'm sharing my talents or things that I have opportunities to share with people, I always do. You never see me leave church and say I don't want to talk to anybody. And if someone has something that I can help them with, I don't think, I don't know if I've refused anybody, but I've tried never to refuse a single person. If they ask me for help, and it's within my sphere of influence, and I have a, one thing that I created in my lifetime was a huge sphere of influence. I know people who are on the street and homeless that I take care of, and I know some multi-gazillionaires too. And it's interesting how you can kind of make all that work together. Look at Art Van. He donated $10 million to me and $35 million to Shirky David. So we could create something at the hospital to help people. But it all came from a sphere of influence. And we hope that we can get him to donate to our church also. So whether it's the homeless, which I went to Toledo for, but I take care of a lot of homeless people who have ear problems, or whether it's the gazillionaires, you still help everybody. And then you may find out that Art Van, well, he did you know, he had took care of furniture, right? But we were gonna set up this new room at the church, so why don't we get him to donate there and all of a sudden you mix things together, right? Mm -hmm. And Dr. David is a master at this kind of stuff. And, but there's a lot of ways that all of us have a sphere of influence that you can work and bring people together to work together. Dr. Shenouda, I mean, I'm an old man now, but Dr. Shenouda, <laughs> was a really, very, one of the smartest guys I've met. He's an interesting guy. He's Coptic Orthodox, who came to this country and learned English and learned our ways and got accepted to medical school in a very prestigious ENT program. And as soon as I met him, I said, and he needs somebody, I started to work that magic together. And he's terrible at making a decision. <laughs> yeah, this is, this he, is between us. <laughs> he had to wait until Easter and his prayer at Easter before he agreed to sign a contract with Sammy. <laughs> but they're going to have a great partnership. I hope that it'll last forever, you know? But it was once again sphere of influences. It's like we do all the ear surgery for Wayne State. So. Through that, I got the opportunity and pleasure of meeting Dr. Shenouda. And then from there, you know, it just, but I mean, I was a farm boy. I grew up on 40 acres. I worked for my dad till I was 25, outside in the cold, and I didn't have a choice. I had to be a well driller, or I had to go into medicine, or be a teacher or a priest. There were only four fields. When I hear people like you and your entrepreneurship, I like, how did you do that? Because in my family, you had to be a teacher, you had to be a priest, or you had to be a doctor. I mean, there weren't, or you worked with that. Yeah. Oh, I pushed back against the people who were <laughs> the outcast. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's sometimes today you guys have so many decisions and so many opportunities, it's really hard to know how to, how to choose the good opportunity for you. So. I kind of answered a little bit of your question in a roundabout way. <laughs> so, sorry. 
Okay, uh, at this time we want to turn it over to Michael. Okay. Just a, just a piggyback off of what's been said is what I'm hoping is we can achieve through tonight is that we end up getting to know each other and each other's skills and specialties in life and that we don't feel inhibited by imposing on each other and saying, hey, I want you to talk to this person. I want you to see if you can mentor these people because we're talking about the church and we're talking about developing relationships with people younger than us. I'm assuming we're all mentors, okay? We're looking for mentees. And that we can impose and say, hey, listen, I want you to talk to this person and you might be even willing to take on the responsibility to be in this person's life the rest of their life. And that's something that I would like to be able to start. And half of Ethan is really good with keeping everybody together and helping. And I'm hoping that we all get to know each other well enough that we can impose saying, hey, I want you to look, talk to this person. But the next thing I also want to impose upon you is there is a program that I would like to be able to present in the fall that would actually help with mentoring because it's about getting together with older and younger people and being able to get and talk to them about their lives, getting them to talk about their lives. And it's put on by Faith Street. It's just a little uh, commercial here. being made man by God as we center our lives on him. But as we recognize our need for God and others on this path, that we gain the strength and courage to become men. The most important thing that we are called to do in this life is to develop and nurture relationships 